Hello everybody, welcome to the third talk of our CCI 2021 Spring Series on the human side of cybersecurity. Um, this is the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative uh, Spring Series. As many of you already know, it includes over $20 million annual investment. It includes all universities in Virginia and number of faculties over 300. Today's talk will be given by Dr. John Doyle coming from Caltech and I had a, a fun time trying to compile all the things that John has done. Um, I would encourage you to go to his website where he has a link to a Dropbox where he provides he calls them rants, uh, very interesting writings, slides, and videos on, on his research. He'll be talking about layer architectural fragility and unsustainability uh, with examples ranging from mountain biking to contexts of nature, ma malware, and cyber attacks. John is a Jean-Louis Chamou Professor of Control and Dynamics Systems, Selective Engineer and Bioengineer at Caltech with uh, prior graduate degrees from MIT and Berkeley. Uh, the research focuses on complex networks, how he says, of all kinds, um, in controls, in resilience, machine learning, um, addressing notions of layering and virtualization. He won a number of IEEE um, and other awards. I'm not even going to try to list them all, but here they are. Um, I found very interesting notes on, on his robust AI teaching on mission-critical control functions in layer architectures. Um, he talks about system-level synthesis, um, and uh, he's, he's also a really well-known um, athlete. He uh, broke a number of world records in rowing, in duathlons, triathlons, and uh, his athletic resume is almost as impressive as his scientific one. Um, again, this is John Doyle. My name is Miles Manik. I'm a professor of computer science at VCU and director of um, VCU Cybersecurity Center. Also, I triple fellow and fellow of uh, CCI, inaugural class of CCI. Welcome again. Please do feel free to type in your questions in Q&A window, and let's welcome John. John, the podium is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay. So is that working okay? Perfect. Okay. So. Again, what I'm going to talk about today is fragility. Um, we've seen a lot of it in the last year, and I think it's unmasked, um, unfortunately, fascinating issues. And I want to try to uh, maybe be a little more breadth and depth on this. So we're doing this virtually. What does that mean? Well, it means we are using some sort of apps, um, Zoom in particular, and these are networked. Um, and virtual means a lot of things, but I'm going to use it in a slightly more technical sense, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So we have these uh, apps which are uh, networked, they're swappable, and they're quite diverse. And so uh, we, we're using that all the time now. Um, and so what do we mean by virtual in this context? Well, it means that the apps aren't really directly connected to each other. They're, they're again, you all know this, um, they're connected through operating systems. And so uh, this is one aspect of virtualization. And the idea is that these connections we would call virtual. But in fact, the OSs aren't directly connected. There's physical hardware. And the physical hardware is also networked and swappable and quite diverse. And so this is all virtual. And again, we call this virtualized. And again, I'm using just you know, our standard terms that we use in talking about the internet. Um, and the hardware, of course, is uh, this physical hardware. It's fairly diverse and fairly uh, swappable, but not as much as the applications. So we call this virtualized, which is, says the operating system virtualizes the physical hardware. So the apps don't need to worry about the details. And so this is uh, the almost canonical example of a virtualized and layered architecture. 
and our use of it is also has a lot of aspects of virtual. So in particular, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail, we are highly virtualized in the sense that almost everything we do is automatic and unconscious. Um, for example, language is mostly, processing is mostly automatic and unconscious. So there's this sort of natural, not a uh, massive amount of virtualization in that sort of most of the functioning that we see in our networks and in ourselves are automatic and unconscious and not visible. And so uh, I like to call this a diversity hourglass. What that means is that you have a really diverse set of swappable applications, and then you have a moderately diverse and moderately swappable hardware. In between, you have an operating system, which uh, allows these two to evolve largely independently of each other. But then that operating system is not very diverse and not very swappable. So, uh, Again, you're all familiar with this. I want to emphasize a particular aspect of this that feeds into our biology a little bit better, which is speed accuracy trade-offs. And so the idea is that um, in addition to having these layers of apps on, on top of OS, on top of hardware, there's a trade-off. Uh, and, and the idea is that we call this a speed accuracy trade-off. So ideally, we'd like to build systems that are fast, accurate, and flexible. But none of these mechanisms by themselves provide that. So for example, if you wanna be really fast in doing some task, whether it's us or our machines, then you want hardware that is specifically tuned to do that. But our greatest flexibility, um, and in fact, accuracy when we talk about uh, say algorithms is in our software. So without the software, we would be uh, very limited in the, in the capabilities we have. Of course, that's all virtualized. Uh, you can't have software running on nothing. It has to be sitting on top of the hardware. Um, and then the operating system, of course, is the key to this architecture, and it's, it's not diverse, it's not swappable. We're, we're sort of stuck with those and a few of them. So I'm going to call this a diversity-enabled sweet spot, and we'll elaborate on this. The idea is that um, if you put these together in just the right way, then what you get is a system that, that for most purposes is fast and flexible. And so that's what we mean by a diverse enabled sweet spot. It means that the system as a whole delivers a capability that no component by itself delivers. And, but we, um, we can build architectures that create these sweet spots. And then the question is, what can go wrong? <laughs> so, so these ideas that I've just talked about, maybe the exact terminology um, isn't familiar to you. But uh, if you're interested in cybersecurity at all, of course, you know all of this. And you know all what these words sort of mean. Um, so I'm going to leverage that to try to talk more broadly about uh, security and fragility in, in other contexts. So the, uh, one of the ideas is sort of what can go wrong. Well, you know a lot about what can go wrong here. Um, and uh, we know that these uh, architectures are very vulnerable to hacking. And we've had a lot of problems with that. But what I want to do is, instead of drilling down on that, I want to think a little more broadly about what can go wrong. In particular, I want to switch over to biology for a bit. And the simplest biology um, that we can talk about in this context is bacteria. And bacteria have genes, uh, uh, something like an operating system and hardware. And so what you can see is the same sort of picture here, where you have an hourglass of swappable and diverse uh, genes Rel fairly diverse proteins, and then an operating system that's not diverse at all. So what do we mean by the operating system here? Well, it's the machinery of transcription and translation and associated utilities. And um, this is not diverse at all in the sense of the protocols that define this are exactly the same for essentially every cell on the planet. So, so what you have is you have a very swappable gene level, but then a not swappable operating system. And so uh, you can have hardware only biology, not in bacteria, but in, in humans. And so the classic example would be red blood cells, which jettison all of their genetic material and all of their transcription and translation machinery and really only run on proteins. And this is to be fast and efficient. So if you want a very targeted functionality in biology, um, you would uh, produce cells that have these very specialized. And the, the neurons in, in the micro wasps are really interesting. So I urge you to, to check that out if you can. Um, so 
So the idea is that if you want to control any of this stuff and you want to be fast and super efficient, then you're going to do it in the protein level. But the idea is that the genes are the parts that are most flexible. So um, bacteria do horizontal gene transfer. Uh, eukaryotes do sexual recombination. You can do selective breeding. You can do genetic engineering. All of those are enabled by this architecture in the same way that the layered architecture of the internet and our computers enable the rapid evolution of our applications. Some side effects of this is antibiotic resistance, which is bad for us. Because bacteria can swap genes, if any one of them gets antibiotic resistance, then it's their neighbors quickly get it. And this is a huge problem for us. For them, this whole architecture is hijacked by phage, which are their versions of viruses. And that's bad for them. So this is also a fairly universal feature of these architectures, that they both create the ability to evolve rapidly, but they're also hijacked. So what we see these things have in common is this hourglass of diversity. And you have these speed accuracy trade-offs. And the greatest flexibility is by having swappable and evolvable genes and applications. Um, but you have to have that in the right architecture. If you don't have that in the right architecture, it's of no use. And again, all those details are virtualized. Um, and so you can be sort of a, a genetic engineer or an application software writer and not know an enormous amount about those details. So we have all these mechanisms in biology. So let's look at another example, um, uh, language. So, um, so of course, we're using all of these now. We're using uh, apps to talk to each other. Um, we're obviously using our biology, but we're also using language. And language is also layered. And the role of operating systems is essentially the grammar. The hardware is uh, the, the things we produce sounds with and our hearing. And in the context of written language, of course, there's typing and writing and reading. So what we are now doing is we're exchanging memes. That's the kind of buzzword to describe what genes are in the context of language. And so there's lots of horizontal transfer that's going on right now. So we've got, we're talking about these kinds of words and I'm trying to tell you what these words mean. And uh, we sort of take for granted that we have a shared operating system. If we didn't have this shared operating system in our language, then this wouldn't work. So language also has a layered architecture. Um, and so nor normally we don't worry about that, but if we wanted to really look in detail at this sentence, we can talk about how it's layered. But of course, when we're using language, this is all virtualized, unconscious, and automatic. We don't have to think about uh, actually all these details. Our brain does it for us automatically. And so what we see here is we get the, this architecture that ha you can describe it in all sorts of ways. Um, but I think the essence of it is, is um, layering and virtualization. And so that's how uh, our app software works. That's how the internet works, cloud IoT. Um, but also, uh, it's also how our culture works. It's how technology generally works. Um, it's how our economies work and so on. And I wanna try to think a little bit more broadly again, even more than this. So let me summarize what I mean by architecture here. So we're gonna use give software and hardware as the example. And the idea is that we have laws, and, and by this I'm taking this meaning very broadly. I can mean physical laws, but I also can mean that in technology there's just certain hardware that we can hardware and software that we can currently build. Now that line shifts as our technology improves, but at any state of our technology, there's a there's a trade-off there. And then what one aspect of architecture is you build lots of things that populate that line. And finally, you do virtualization to create this sweet spot. Now notice that. Um, that it's a diversity enabled sweet spot. Just having the component diversity by itself really doesn't do much. You actually have to get it in just the right architecture, layered in just the right way to get these sweet spots. So what can go wrong? So we've got all these fabulous uh, results of being able to do horizontal transfer and sharing in, in this space, but uh, what happens is this universality is exploited. So viruses can stick their genes in. And what they do is they exploit the fact that there is this sort of universal API sitting there. And, uh, and so you, the, the viruses, whether they're technological or biological, can inject themselves into the operating system. And we'll see that me bad memes uh, get circulated as well. Now let's contrast this with predators. 
predators, unlike pathogens, don't care about architecture. They just want the meat. And so they can destroy the architecture. But pathogens hijacked intact architectures to reproduce or uh, primarily to reproduce, but uh, also do other things. And if you look at the pathogens that are uh, in the you know, famous ones in humans, um, enormous varieties, but all of them hijack some aspect of some parts of the operating systems of cells and tissues. And of course we have our new favorite, uh, COVID. So malware is also a similar problem. It hijacks. Uh, the, this, uh, the fact that we can so easily do all this swapping means that you can swap in bad stuff. And there's obviously, you know this well. And of course, social media is a very sophisticated kind of hijacking. So it's hijacking not only our, uh, our networks, but also our, our social interactions. And we'll want to try to understand that a, a little bit better. So one of the most interesting topics, which I'm not going to have time to go on to, is this thing of zombie parasites, which do very sophisticated hijacking of their hosts. And so, of course, zombies are a science fiction, but in science fiction, they're both a combination of predator and pathogen. And in real life, you see something like rabies, which is kind of an example of this, where you have a virus that hijacks sophisticated behavior of a predator in order to propagate. And so, uh, fortunately, uh, when we see this, we're able to avoid it. So we tend not to get rabies, but it is uh, almost always fatal. So what I want to talk a little bit now is how this plays out in our immune system and what's going on with COVID. And again, this is a uh, very hot research topic for us. And I'm only going to do this very superficially. Uh, you know, stay tuned for uh, the technical details. But let me try to give this idea, which is the immune system has a layered architecture. And that layering is there again to produce a sweet spot, to produce um, speed and accuracy in our ability to handle pathogens that we couldn't have if we did not have a layered architecture in this way. So this is sort of a cartoon version of this and I wouldn't take it too seriously, but there's this rich layering um, and the stuff we're gonna worry about most is the stuff at the bottom, the behavior that we use to avoid infections, the barriers that we use to prevent them and the innate immune system, which is our initial reactions. So here are, is an example of two um, uh, types of viruses. What I'm plotting here is I'm plotting the symptoms as a function of time. And so on the left, we have a uniformly mild case. And on the right, we have a uniformly bad case. And the left would be sort of like common colds, rhinoviruses. On the right would be like a good example would be MERS. Ebola is, is kind of an example, but it's technically doesn't fit this quite right. So, um, but, so what, what's the consequences of this? Well, in the uniformly mild case, what happens is uh, over time, uh, because the sick individual shows no symptoms, um, if they are shedding virus, then it's easily, it's easy to transmit it to others and it spreads. Um, however, because it's uniformly mild, nobody gets too sick and the impact is not so great. A uniformly bad case is where you very quickly get very severe symptoms and everybody gets sick. What happens over time with that is that um, because the individual who is sick is showing very overt symptoms, they can be isolated. And so as a consequence, they're much less likely to infect. So this case can actually be limited. And MERS was uh, far more deadly than the current uh, coronavirus, but it was limited because it had very quick onset of symptoms. Now, the more interesting case for our purposes is where there's diversity. So I've been talking about diversity as a good thing, and it's good when we have it, and it's bad when our enemies have it. And so, so what we have is we have diversity in time, that is the onset of symptoms is delayed, and we have diversity across hosts. So some people get very sick, other people don't get sick at all. And um, a pure time version of this would be roughly HIV, and a pure host version would be sort of this H1N1 flu in 1918. But, but SARS-CoV-2 has actually both mechanisms, um, which is interesting and deadly. So the consequence of this is that over time, um, we have 
pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic individuals. I'm sort of trying to draw a cartoon that suggests that. And what they can do is they can spread because, uh, they, because they're asymptomatic, nobody knows. And in the, la in the absence of really effective testing and tracing, this happens. And then what happens over time is that person could get quite ill, possibly. And then other people may get mild illnesses or be pre-symptomatic for more serious illnesses or nothing at all. And so uh, over time, you get this evolution uh, where you, you uh, both spread and can have really horrible symptoms, which you couldn't have in the previous cases. So we're going to simplify this picture just to say, you know, you start with a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic individuals and it spreads and can be quite severe. So you have these three sort of cartoons, and these are very much cartoons. We, we're, we have some math under the hood that can try to explain this, but I'm not gonna have time to do that. But what I wanna do is, is just emphasize you have these three very different cases, and here the diversity hurts us. So if we look at what the trade-offs are here, uh, I wanna think about, again, this trade-off and transmission and virulence from the point of view of both the host and the pathogen. So here's the idea is that these, these two occupy sort of corners of this space. Um, so you have the high transmission and very low virulence and, and just the virulence is just you know, sort of how bad things are. And then uh, you have this very bad high virulence, but it doesn't transmit much because the symptoms are uh, such that they, they can limit the spread. So where would the host like this to be? Well, ideally the host would like to be in the corner, no transmission, no virulence at all. And so our immune system has evolved to try to push pathogens into that corner. Now, the virus maybe would rather be up here. Um, and again, one has to be careful when you were in words like viruses would rather, but evolution would tend to push a virus here if, if all other things were equal. But there's a war going on here. And we have this whole complex uh, immune system. And so what ends up happening is you sort of get this evolutionary trade-off where most viruses kind of live on this boundary and we could list a lot of them. But uh, SARS-CoV-2, because it has both mechanisms, actually is both highly transmissible and highly virulent. And here the diversity again is doing us harm. And it does this, and I'm not gonna be able to talk about this, it does this by very cleverly hijacking several layers of this architecture. And so, um, so we can mechanistically understand, and again, it's almost, a, a, it's almost a cyber problem in the sense that the attack is very much on the computing and communication infrastructure. So we have this sort of, sort of picture um, of, the, of this variation. Now, one of the things that we also get is strong race and wealth inequalities in the, in the host response. So now we could imagine possibly that, oh, we've got a racist virus. Well, that may be true, but it's much more likely and much clearer that what's happening is this virus is amplifying systemic race and wealth inequality and fragility. And we've heard a lot of the use of this word systemic in this context. And, uh, I don't disagree with much of that, but I think it's in some ways just much, much worse than the conventional story is. And what I wanna do is drill down on what that word systemic means in this context. So we've got all sorts of systemic fragilities and, uh, and I wanna try to see if we can say something uh, meaningful, again, from a cyber, kind of a cybersecurity, how would you fix this if it was your job to provide security for infrastructure like this? So, you know, what else can go wrong? So one of the things about horizontal transfer of diverse memes, which we've been talking about them, SAT, fragility, hourglass evolvability, those are all memes that we've been talking about today. The problem is we can also do bad meme transfer, just like we can do bad gene transfer by viruses. We can do bad meme transfer and we're doing it all the time. And it's, and our, the facility with which we can uh, exchange bad memes means that they can really spread. And so what are humans arguably biggest problem right now? That we have things that are, we believe things, a lot of people believe things that are false, unhealthy and dangerous. In fact, you could argue that the most strongly held beliefs in our society are of this nature. 
And so we, you know, you can list your favorite popular but dangerous ideas. And social media has really accelerated this. And so I'm kind of putting social media in both columns. And of course, you know, again, I have a few of my favorites, but you can list yours. But in any case, these are all things that are facilitated now by social media. So is science exempt from this? We, we all want to follow the science and indeed science is our best tool for uh, dealing with this. But in fact, science is also easily hijacked. And so I sort of call this zombie science and I have a lot of papers and and videos online about uh, exactly what this is. But if you look at the scientific literature on anything that I'm talking about now, having to do with complexity in networks, it's just junk, it's false and it's dangerous. Um, so science is our best tool, but it too can be hijacked just like anything else. And so we'd like to have a robust science and unfortunately we have less than we could have. But what else can go wrong? So I wanna talk a little bit about this issue. So COVID has aggravated and exposed what I think are pervasive inequalities in all sorts of ways. And I think the inequalities show up in many dimensions. And obviously we can't go into all of them, but we can, we can maybe have a little bit of a look at this. So, so where do these inequalities come from? Um, so we could ask, what is the architecture of inequality and systemic fragility at the society level? So I can ask, What's the architecture here? We have the software operating system hardware architecture for our computers and our networks. And I'm claiming that roughly that sort of layered architecture holds for biology, it holds for language, and it holds for a lot of things in society. But in the lower left, I wanna ask, what's the architecture of the legal or the justice system that, that gets hijacked for inequality? So what's the hardware? Well, the obvious sort of first cut answer is it's the police, the corrections, and the parole officers. And that's the kind of uh, tip of the spear, but we wanna know what the rest of the architecture looks like. So you might think tentatively, let's say that the legislature is the swappable application. It's where new laws are made and rewritten. And then the courts sit in the middle between the hardware and the legislature, and it's sort of the operating system. So the legislature doesn't directly work to the hardware. The legislature passes laws and the courts interpret them. So you don't have a direct connection between uh, these and the courts play the role of the operating system here. And this is very tentative because I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm trying to look at this and this is a, a new thing for me to try to look at, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you what our sort of analysis of this Again, thinking of it almost as a cybersecurity problem. What's gone wrong? Um, so the idea is that if you're sitting outside of this system, it's highly virtualized. So all you see is the police. So when you talk about systemic racism, it's natural to think about it in the context of the police. But I'm going to argue that while it may be there, like our virus, it really is unmasking much deeper fragilities. And what I'm going to say is that the systemic racism is much bigger in this hidden virtualized area than it is in the apparent one. And again, this is no surprise to anybody who has followed any of this. So I want to talk about both systemic racism and systemic fragility. So how does this system get hijacked? Um, and so what I want to use is I want to use civil rights as a starting point for understanding hijacking. So these are famous uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution, and the 13th uh, in principle eliminated slavery, the 14th gave sl former slaves rights, 15th gave male former slaves the vote, and then much later the women were given the vote. And then there's been the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, very important, the Voting Rights Act, which is currently being dismantled. Um, but the idea is what I'm claiming is this zombie law has destroyed all of these so that these are, have been blunted. Now, there's a really great movie uh, on the 13th Amendment that I don't think I can improve on. Uh, I urge you to see this, but I'm gonna talk about the 14th. The 14th Amendment has been heavily used by uh, the courts, in particular the Supreme Court, but not for civil rights, but against them. Not only has it been blunted, it's actually been turned around and weaponized against civil rights. And I wanna to try to explain why that is. Um, so again, this is the 14th Amendment. Uh, I'm not gonna read it, but the idea is that it says, everybody, so it doesn't ever mention slaves. It just says, if you're born here, you're a citizen. And the state, which 
in this case was uh, targeted at the Confederacy, uh, couldn't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process, and uh, can't de deny uh, equal protection. Okay, so, and the intent was to provide these benefits to the slave, former slaves that were freed by the 13th Amendment. But in fact, what's it really been used for? It's really been used against civil rights. So the obvious ones are the Plessy uh, decision in the Supreme Court in 1896 that basically enshrined the key aspect of segregation, which was the notion of separate but equal. Of course, separate did not mean equal. Um, so that's, a, that's one of the key decisions in the history of civil rights, and it went against civil rights, and it was based on the 14th Amendment. We've also heard a lot about how the uh, police are shielded from any consequences of their violence. And that's really built out of several uh, Supreme Court decisions. One that produced this notion of qualified immunity and the other one produced this sort of malicious or sadistic intent standard. And basically it makes prosecution of police Im impossible either through criminal or civil uh, routes. And then a weird thing is that it was even used to prevent local jurisdiction uh, gun laws. So these were all based on the 14th Amendment. So I'm claiming that there's a systemic racism that goes much deeper than that. And the 14th Amendment not only hasn't been benefit to civil rights, it's been used against it. But it's actually a lot worse than that. So we have these examples, but there's a lot more. And so what I wanna say though, is that what it is, it's the architecture of this system. It doesn't depend on the individual's behaviors. You could swap in, uh, you could swap in cops that weren't racist and that would help. But as long as you've got deep racism in the system, um, it won't fix everything. And then there's systemic fragilities that are, that are the consequence of this. And I wanna say how that's played out as well. So this 14th has been sort of virtualized and hijacked, but it's much worse than I've even said. So um, what we can do to fix this is we can try to undo the hijacking like we would do in any attack, say on our cyber infrastructure. But we also wanna, we can't get rid of virtualization, but we can try to make it more transparent. And so what I wanna do is say, how could we maybe what, what are these and how can we get rid of them? So this is in the sort of now what else can go wrong? Um, and so what I wanna talk about a little bit more about is this zombie law, the idea that 14th amendment has been used not for civil rights, but actually for corporations. So how does that work? Person here has been essentially defined to be corporations and exclusively corporations. What I mean by that is the Supreme Court has heard hundreds of 14th amendment cases more than 300 of them were civil rights of corporations and less than 30 for civil rights of African-Americans. So to a first approximation, the 14th Amendment has been for corporations. And it's been used for corporations, not neutrally, but in fact, to very much hurt African-Americans and, and, and basically all other Americans. So again, a cartoon version of what a corporation is, it has four kind of stakeholders um, and it sits between them. And it's a, a, so this is a very rough picture of the architecture of a corporation. So what, what this um, use of the 14th Amendment has done is basically turned this into uh, an architecture that only supports uh, the shareholders. Its only function, its only purpose is to provide shareholder value. And the other three customers, the customers, the employees, and the suppliers have basically been uh, essentially tried and as best as possible to return to slavery. Um, now, nothing as bad as our chattel slavery uh, in, the, in the South before the war, but it's, it's the modern version of it. And so if you look at the sort of Dow Jones industrial average, which is what this is aimed at producing, it had a little blip there uh, in, in uh, last year, uh, about a year ago, but since it has gone to record highs. And if you look at 2020, the total US income overall increased by a trillion dollars or more than a trillion dollars. But essentially all of that went to less than 1000 billionaires and everybody else was neutral. And we look over time from 1980 till now, we see this really exponential growth in the, in the, uh, in a couple blips that was, um, you know, 2008. Um, and that is last year. Um, but quickly recovered. 
And those blips were disasters for the rest of the economy, but they're, bah, they're a little blip in the, in the relentless upward march. So we have this system that's really designed to make this really robust and really, uh, and what happens is everything else is goes down. And there's even sort of theorems and control theory that we could apply to this. It says, if you focus exclusively on one objective, then everything else will get, will tend to get much worse. And again, this isn't just kind of a drift. This isn't just a system kind of gradually evolving to be this. This was, this has been a systemic hijacking of our legal and economic infrastructure. And amazingly, the 14th Amendment has been a key element in this. So not only is the 14th Amendment not been good for civil rights, it's been a disaster for everybody. So uh, the side effect of that is, of course, uh, um, environmental disaster as well. And so we see not only the systemic racism in this system, but its systemic fragilities. So we can sort of call these sort of zombie corporations. And these contribute to all these inequalities, could contribute to maintaining them. Um, once they're there, this is a great system to maintain them. So I can sort of call this sort of zombie law. And again, it's very much, uh, benefiting from this virtualization, so we don't see this, um, and hijacking uh, particularly the 14th Amendment. So these civil rights laws were necessary, but they're not sufficient. They've all been uh, repurposed, in fact, to damage civil rights. And so zombie law has really undone all of them, and those efforts continue. So I've really given you a, a fly through of, I would say, an extremely uh, stretched version of what security is. But what we see is that the things we worry about in cybersecurity are all over the place. And the insights, hopefully, that we are getting about all of these can be shared and we can do something with them. Now, what I haven't talked about is any of the mathematics. And so what, what I really work on is the mathematics. And um, in 30 minutes, I can't, unfortunately, even tell you anything about it. But, but um, but there's lots of videos and papers uh, online. So if you're interested in what this looks like, you can trace from this talk down into all sorts of uh, mathematics. Um, and it's all sort of about a, a theory of this. What's the mathematics underlying this? The other thing I haven't, I've only hinted at is that there is really, I think, potential for a new and deep theory of social architecture here. And so what I've started working on is some examples of that and have developed a theory. And in looking around for examples of that theory, um, I couldn't find any human societies, maybe some old hunter gatherers and stuff like that, but nothing definitive. But I did find out that there's animal models and I call them the Ebos, the elephants, the bonobos and the orcas. And they have, I mean, as organisms, they're incredibly different. I mean, they couldn't be more different, um, but, they share a common social architecture. So when I say the internet and the bacterial cell and language all share a common architecture, even though they're extremely different, it's a similar thing here. They share a common architecture that we think we understand now. Um, and it's quite remarkable. Uh, it's also quite fragile. All of these, uh, all of these are endangered. Um, and so, but it is, it does at least give us animal models and it's possible, I believe, that humans could have a much better social architecture, but it would be radically different than the one we have now. So here are my, my current students. Um, and they are, uh, you know, when I say the theory, I mean what they're doing. And so there's a lot of math under the hood that, that these uh, students are doing. Anish also helped a lot with this COVID story. Um, and so if you want to hear more, um, I'm horribly disorganized, so I have a clunky old ancient website. But if you go there, you can get to my sort of public Dropbox, and I have this exact uh, lecture there, and and um, and also a whole bunch of other stuff that follows from this. So if you're interested in in seeing more details of any of this, I I uh, suggest you go there. So I guess we're have some time for hopefully questions. Thank you very much, John. Um, 
we have a question and you may recognize the name it's coming from david david woods um, oh no oh god when i was talking about <laughs> anyway so go ahead. yeah no. here we go terrific right? terrific, terrific. <laughs> so david is saying do good architectures have mechanisms to damp or reveal or counter inevitable hijacking not not necessarily so it's easy to build an architecture that doesn't do that. And the original internet architecture didn't do it at all. So the idea is it was you assume that everybody who had a connection was, was uh, safe. So it had to be added later. And because it wasn't a, a part of the initial design, it's been sort of a hack and it hasn't worked very well. Um, so we have a very complex immune system that has been developed explicitly to protect us from pathogens. And uh, so uh, the layered architecture is, we could some sense say is neutral in the sense that it both facilitates hijacking and if deployed properly can prevent it. But I would say right now, our theories of how to do that in general are rather fragmented. So again, to put it kind of simply, we, we deal with predators and we deal with pathogens with very different mechanisms. And we don't understand very well how you should trade those off. So there's a lot of work to be done there. So I would say, I mean, the bad news is all this layering and virtualization just hides all the details and we can be attacked and we have no idea where they're coming from. The good news is uh, I think you can create immune systems that are also layered, but they have to be really designed carefully because what's gonna happen is you're gonna fix one problem and, and create new ones. And I think that's the sort of whack-a-mole that we're struggling with with respect to uh, a lot of our complex networks. Yes, and uh, in this game of uh, whack-a-mole, the diversity on enemy side is, is not helping, right? No, I think that's one of the problems is we have uh, a lot of diversity on the on the hijacker side, and I would say poor diversity on our side. Can you uh, maybe uh, put this a little bit more in context of cybersecurity? So we have all the tools in the world, and we keep on developing new ones. And in the past, we had a dumb intrusion detection systems. Now we have intelligent ones that are machine learning empowered, that are distributed can do all kinds of things. Um, how do you see the path of, of taking diversification on defender side when it comes to cybersecurity? What, what are we missing? What we should be looking into? Well, I think superficially, the, the, you know, the idea that you, you, have, you have layers of defense and on our immune system, uh, our first line of defense is behavior. We, we, we try to notice dangerous situations and avoid them. We try to avoid a lot of our, a lot of the reason we are disgusted at certain things is we sort of have this innate behavioral reaction to things that would potentially cause us to get infections. Um, so uh, we see that, but what I would say is that our, our immune system has evolved in an ad hoc way, incrementally in an arms race with our pathogens. Um, we're now trying to step back and say, if we understand this more deeply, maybe we can have much better uh, interventions medically. Um, no, I'm not into say, well, let's, let's use CRISPR to redesign the whole thing. I'm saying let's intervene, intervene appropriately with both behavior and medicine and policy. And we can do that if we understand the immune system better, which we don't. We don't understand the immune system well at all. Um, I would, so I would say cybersecurity state is analogous in the sense that it's kind of evolved uh, piecemeal in reaction to uh, attacks. Um, I would say we have we don't have as much architectural view of that as we do for say how to get packets around. So we have a good picture of this layered architecture to just move packets around and run apps. If we were to ask for what would be the appropriate architecture for security, I think it's it's less it's less 
clear what the trade-offs are and what the optimums look like. And so I think we, we need a much deeper theory of that, but I would say there's nowhere where we have I, this issue with a kind of clarity. So the, we have incredible clarity about say the architecture of the cell, this, you know, genes, transcription, translation, proteins. We know a lot about that. When we look at that layered architecture, I showed you that sort of cartoon of the immune system. Um, it's a cartoon. We, there's so much we don't know about that. And uh, so I don't think we have good examples for security done well. Uh, so I think I'm interested in really how to deeply rethink it. And so I think it's fine to you know, take what you have and oh, let's slap machine learning on top of it. Oh, let's, I think what, what's lacking is any kind of really architectural view of what, of what the trade-off space is and what architectures would create layers of uh, security that would be better than just kind of throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. But I wish I knew. I wish I knew how to do that. I don't. Right. Well, it happened over the many years, uh, centuries, and incrementally, like you said, it's it's far from simple to to grasp or mimic. Yeah. Um, we have uh, uh, some new questions coming okay. in. Okay. Um, I'll I'll read the question without commenting. Uh, okay. Could you elaborate? if time permits, the role of externalities to existing architectures? Ah, yes, that's a, that's a good question. So um, economists tend to use externalities as this kind of broad thing to cover things not in their models. And so uh, and one of the obsessions with the, the subject of robust control, which kind of started in the 80s, and I was very involved with at the time, was there's always stuff you don't know. Even in an engineering system, you, there are details that you can't be sure of. And you wanna build a system that's robust to all those things you don't know. So some of them can be external shocks. So if you're trying to land an airplane, you, there, you could have internal failures of components or you could have severe wind gusts or you, know, you can have all sorts of things. And in a military setting, you have people attacking you. So in engineering, you're obsessed with identifying those things and mitigating their effects and having an architecture that does that. Um, now, what I would like to do and haven't is, ha is more deeply connect the ideas of robustness in engineering and in biology where many of the same issues arise and many of the same solutions uh, evolve, uh, connect it up with economics. And um, there's a Nobel Prize winning economist um, who has basically written a book uh, taking a first cut at that. And, uh, and I think, but I think it needs a lot more work. So the stuff I'm talking about social architecture would be economics, it would be political science, it would be social science. And um, this kind of architectural view is just not there. So they think there's, it's a very flat view of the world. Um, and, um, and we see, you know, we have these extremely virtualized situations where, again, you know, I talk about the fact that we, you know, walk into the store, we buy food, we have no idea where it came from, we are flush our toilets, we have no idea where it goes, we turn the faucet on, and it has to be that way. We can't see all those details, but we have to make, to make them sustainable, we have to do, the, do it very differently. Um, and so it could be both a strength in the sense that we could keep the interface the same, but actually have the water come in a more sustainable way. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And I think we have to work with the economists, um, but this is again, a very first cut at trying to make contact with the with social architecture. And the problem is this theory that we're developing is so different than anything humans have ever thought about that, again, the only models are animals. There aren't any human models for this. Um, you know, there may be a little bit, but, and you can see places that are a little more towards this Ebo world than, than others, but we're pretty much chimps with guns. <laughs> we're chimps with guns, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that, but I will read the next question. Um, uh, by the way, one of the attendees is asking about The Economist uh, and the book, uh, if you can reference. Oh, gosh. That's embarrassing. I'm, that, that's terrible. I got, oh, sorry, okay. senior moment. It's, we'll, 
it's it's go, it's, go it, it's it's got robustness in the title and he's from i think stanford oh this is terribly embarrassing okay no no worries we'll google it uh, <laughs> here, here's another question from from a different angle the question goes like this are there studies of non-layered architectures that might help with fragility well i think um certainly again if i go back to the robust control in the aerospace world in the early 80s um, if you if your computers are so much cheaper and so much faster than the say hundred million dollar airplane you're putting them in then you don't need a layered architecture because there's no trade-offs you just make sure that your communication and your computing have no impact on the system and you make it quad redundant and you you know you just you just people, throw, people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just, you know, and so um, there's a certain sense in which it's layered, but it's not layered in this sense of being really driven by tough. Now we're not like that. If you look at our brains implementing similar control systems, because that hardware is not infinitely cheap and infinitely fast and infinitely accurate, there's trade-offs. And those trade-offs force you to have a layered architecture. But it's only when you have these sort of trade-offs, when you want, when you want speed and flexibility together, that none of that your hardware by itself and a flat architecture doesn't deliver. One of the attendees found the 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 the, the, the book online. It, it is it the robustness by uh, Lars Peter Hansen by any chance? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we tried. We tried. <laughs> I, I should be back. That's it's terrible. No, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Okay. How do, how do systems protect themselves from new information? For example, the classic vaccines causing autism. The initial paper spread pretty quickly, but it was proven to be false that information spread slowly or was not accepted at all. Yeah, so that's a story that I'm, you know, just trying to start to understand. Um, and uh, I think it's, in some sense, it's not hard to understand superficially, but, but the superficial answer is incomplete. But the idea is that um, you can have selfish genes that don't do anything, they just propagate. Um, what's special about memes is uh, they don't have to do anything at all to propagate. Um, you can, I mean, obviously we have a lot of what we exchange is is deliberately fictional. So you know we novelists write novels and we read them and we enjoy them, and we don't believe they're they're maybe true in some deep sense, but they're not true in detail. So it's really easy for with language to create uh, memes that are just wrong. And now, if you ask what what is the characteristics of a meme that makes it propagate. Containing truth is only one of many and not the most powerful. And in fact, in a social setting like we live in, deleterious memes actually propagate often better than ones that are good for you. So why is that? Well, if we're part of some group and in the beliefs of our group include a bunch of things that are false and harm us, then those are signatures of our loyalty to the group. So if it doesn't take it doesn't take any commitment on my part to be a scientist and a mathematician, those things benefit me. So by my saying, oh, you know, I use math, that doesn't tell you anything about me as a member of the math group because, but if I'm part of a group in which a lot of things they believe harms me, then my belief in those harmful facts or false harmful things tells you very, very reliably that I'm a sincere member of this group. I'm not here just because it benefits me. Now, this is all virtualized and hidden and unconscious. So people aren't consciously saying, oh yeah, he believes this QAnon nonsense, and we know it's crap, but because he believes it, he's one of us. Nobody goes through that thought process. That's all automatic and unconscious.
but that's an aspect of it. And so, so, and again, it's much more complicated than that. And, but I think these highly virtualized layered architectures allow, allow for bad genes to propagate, but they also allow bad memes to propagate. And, but in the, in the meme case, the mechanisms for propagating bad memes is really powerful much more so even than the viruses and the bacteria circulate. So, so I think that's one of the problems and we don't have a good immune system for it. Uh, what you said, uh, if the news contains truth is not the most powerful, is something that I think we will, uh, we will be thinking of probably for a long time to come. Um, Ron Boring, uh, found the book and he says uh, recent, oh no, uh, recent economists with Nobel Prize from Stanford Alvin Roth, Paul Migram and Robert Wilson. Oh, this no, this is a, this this guy got his Nobel a long time ago, so. Right, right, right. right, right. God, I'm really sorry. It's so embarrassing to have, but you know, I, I'm getting well, old, my memory's terrible. We'll, we'll find it eventually and so. we'll communicate and tell the audience later on. Uh, we're getting closer to the end of, of today's talk. Um, before I thank you for, for, for joining us and, and, and uh, giving us this, this very interesting broad overview of uh, and different angles of complex systems, I always wanted to ask you since, since uh, we had that uh, NSF workshop uh, a few years back, um, you have an um, unusually rich athletic career um, and uh, you uh, uh, got to hurt yourself a uh, number of times uh, uh, trying things that, that for human body are extremely challenging. Um, looking at what you talk about and what you have done in your athletic career, can you comment on how one reinforced, uh, helped, inspired, uh, complemented the other? Uh... Yeah, I can, I can give you a superficial answer, which is um, I was extremely lucky uh, that, you know, the genes I got from my parents. So nothing I've done, you know, I've had world records and world championships, but none of them are due to anything other than, you know, lucky genes. And, <laughs> and you know, the... The, also the luck of having the luxury of being able to train, all that stuff. So it just, it's all luck. I also unfortunately have some really bad genes. So I have some really bad flaws. And so I have sort of these extremes of, of performance, but also extreme fragility. And it's conceivable that that, I mean, so the fragility has been frustrating. I mean, since I was 13 years old, I've had like you know, a month that I wasn't injured. <laughs> so I've been always injured, always working around injuries. Um, and then also I'm really stupid. So I do really stupid things and end up hurting myself. So um, I think you could make up a story that all I'm doing is trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I've got all these hidden fragilities, everything I try to do to fix them creates new problems. And so you could imagine that, oh, oh this is just, a reflection of my mostly failed a athletic career. So I, I can make it sound like I've had a great athletic career, but in fact, it's been mostly failure and loss uh, and occasionally uh, something like a world record, but most of the time it's just lose, 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 injured, rehab. So I guess you could say there's a connection, um, but mostly I'm really stupid and I wanna try to figure out how to stop being stupid because I do that in other things as well. So, well, you've been exploring. I love how you say uh, loss, 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 and occasional world record. <laughs> Here uh, and there, some world records, right? <laughs> um, but yeah. also, the thing is, though, a lot of sports, um, particularly team sports, um, <clears throat> you got to be there Saturday at 3 p.m. and perform. And I'm terrible at that. And so, <clears throat> so that's what I mean is it's, I'm, a, I'm basically a loser. And so, in that sense. And so the nice thing about the records is that you do those any time and they count. And so you don't have to be there at the time that's necessary. So, so um, it's, it's not as impressive as it looks. 
Well, uh, we are at the top of the hour. My comment will be that, uh, John, you are still very extremely humble uh, uh, oh. person with a No, I'm not. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Powerful research oh. career. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we are looking forward to talking to you more. Uh, this was the third talk of, of, um, of our series. Uh, the next talk, I will very briefly announce our next talk will be given by Dr. Ron Boring. And so please do mark your calendars for the um, um, 15th of April. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And, and ask more great. questions of me. And look, there's lots more material online if you want to drill down on any of this. Yes, please. Yes. We will stay in touch. Okay. Thank you, John, again. Thank great. you, everybody. Have a great rest Thank of the you. day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.